Uh, but the building is, blows up and they don't stop the suspects. But no, no, uh, please don't understand. This supposedly was afterwards. This was uh, supposedly the suspects of the bombing. Sure, itself. sure. Yeah. Um, that went on through all the morning up until about one thirty. Uh, at, at that point, I had an opportunity to speak to one of the FBI agents that had kind of slowed to take a break and asked him what the uh, status was and uh, was informed at that point that uh, uh, that was disinformation, that it was designed to throw the press off and uh, was nothing but disinformation. Uh, I became very irate at the time uh, in that they were, they were broadcasting this to a five-state area. Uh, it was not only throwing all the media off, it was throwing every cop in the world uh, off as well, uh, if this was fictitious information. Well, the perps want to throw folks off. So, so Terrence Yagey pulls up a minute or so after, and it's crawling with FBI and ATF. And then uh, what happens next? Well, he goes ahead and works with the uh, uh, recovery. Uh, from what I understand, over the this next few days after, uh, after that incident, he had uh, started to complain to Janet Reno and to others uh, uh, about the treatment that he was getting from the FBI agents and also from the, from the uh, fact that there were so many of them on the scene. It was quite quite uh, concerning to him. We talked a little bit about uh, some of his concerns and some of my concerns, but we both were still, um, uh, I'd say it still wasn't really that trustworthy even of one another. Uh, it, was, it was a time where you really didn't know who you could trust um, Completely or not. Sure, if you're not a completely unconscious moron, you pull up and there's, it's like watching a guy run out of a bank with a mask on and a bag of money, you know who, you pull up and there's feds running around in their, in their full gear right after it happens, you're like, well, what's going on? They're like, oh, nothing. In fact, th th there were doctors and people there who they would say, patch me up. I was up on the ninth floor and the doctors are like, well, you, there's nothing wrong with you. You weren't up there. And he's like, well, you're going to end up dead if you, you you know don't do what I say. I mean, this death threatening. I just can't imagine people just, I'm a fed. I'm going to death threat police and everybody else because I'm God. I mean, it sounds like a bunch of lunatics. Yeah, it, uh, uh, oh, it was interesting, like I said, with, with Terry in that uh, uh, when, when Terry died, he was not treated as a normal police officer. There was no uh, autopsy performed. Uh, he, he, of course, was uh, was viewed by a medical examiner, and they did uh, complete the uh, death certificate and, and follow-up reports. Uh, but no autopsy, nothing to describe uh, why the injuries that uh, Terry had uh, uh, suffered, uh, where they came from, or what, what type of injuries those were. But we do have that. What thanks to Colonel Craig Roberts going from memory, we do have the, the the basic medical examiner's drawings and and of course the you know you guys have talked to some of the witnesses and some of the sheriff's department I know from the county over that that, that did show up reportedly and, and and so go over this in detail. The feds are like digging dirt up. Ye uh, Terrence Yankee's obviously been tortured. I mean, as a police officer, go over what happened to him. Well, Terry had numerous uh, lacerations on his wrist across his elbows. Uh, on both arms, he had a long uh, cut that began just uh, underneath his right ear and extended past his uh, Adam's apple. Uh, there was another small hesitation cut on the left side of his throat. Uh, uh, you, you think that was when they were just threatening him to slit his throat to get the answers of where the stuff was? Well, I was told by the district attorney when I went to the grand jury that it was due to uh, EMT trying to save Jerry's life. Oh. And of course, he'd been dead. Well, I mean, let's go over it. I mean, let's talk about how he died because, I mean, he, he was telling his partner, I got feds behind me last time he was heard from, right? Ter Terry was uh, transporting documents and uh, evidence that he had collected. He called his friend, uh, another police officer, said, uh, let's meet for dinner. As soon as I shake these feds who are following me, we'll meet. Terry went to El Reno. Terry grew up in El Reno, Oklahoma. He knew all the back roads. And his car is found on federal property. El Reno has a federal prison. The reason the federal government was able to come in and take control of the investigation was that his body was found on federal land. Yeah, so they did that again. Wow. Exactly. And when his he had handcuff marks on his wrists, there was mud packed into his wounds. There was no way he could have drug himself through the mud a mile and a half through creeks and trees while bleeding and then decided to shoot himself 
at an angle at the top of his head uh, coming out the lower part of his jaw. Sure, so uh, let me ask this. Cops, everybody shows up. I mean, you talk about the county shows up, and they said, yeah, the feds were covering it up, and the police all just stand around, and, well, they killed him. That's, I mean, because all the police we've talked to, yeah, they killed him. And I, and I guess that's just what feds are God. They want to kill cops. Go ahead, you know. Well, that's what was interesting uh, to me to, uh, at that point was any time we had a, a police officer involved in an automobile accident or anything outside of the city limits, uh, the city still sent uh, investigative uh, officers out to uh, uh, investigate the accident. Have nothing else to supplement uh, whatever agency did do the investigation. Uh, with Terry, it was just basically our agency just washed their hands of it and turned it completely over to the FBI. And uh, uh, yeah, whenever a police officer dies in Oklahoma City, there's always an autopsy. A couple of years ago, a police officer died in a car wreck. Um, and there was no question about why he had died. He was on duty. He was responding to a call. They still performed an autopsy, yet they find a police officer just a couple years before in a field cut uh, bleeding. A year shot, after, shot. a year after, he's the hero of Oklahoma City on yeah. the cover of Newsweek and Police Officer of the Year. Shot in the head, and they do not perform an autopsy. Once again, it does not hold up to scrutiny at all. Well, who is who was this this police chief? I mean, who is either purely wicked or the biggest coward on the planet? Uh, he was a um, uh, Chief Gonzalez was from the Dallas Fort Worth area. He had been on Dallas PD uh, prior to his being hired with Oklahoma City. He really didn't have uh, connections to Oklahoma City um, and would frequently leave uh, for extended weekends to go play golf in Dallas. Um, uh, really, never did feel like he was a portion of our department at all. So he was just a just a placeholder. Yes, sir. He was also a young uh, patrolman in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So he's a very trustworthy person. Uh, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know if he had any involvement with that, but that's, that is his background. I like Dan Rather. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, continuing uh, here. There's a lot of other points here that are important. Uh, can you tell us about the horse patrol being mobilized for crowd control prior to the bombing? Yes, sir. Uh, again, that was one of the things that kind of surprised me. The horse patrol basically, uh, through the week, did not patrol any area. They maybe once or twice, uh, uh, one or two of the officers would saddle up and they would go into the stock arch area. Uh, Horses are for special events, right? I mean, big yes, crowds. Sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, interestingly, they had, uh, anytime we did work a big event, uh, they would have the county reserve would also come in and supplement the uh, uh, with horses and manpower, uh, and they would act out uh, together. The morning of the bombing, uh, the horse patrol was going downtown in force. Uh, they claim they really don't know why they were going down there. It wasn't necessary for crowd control. They were just going down to to work the downtown area. This was about a week before what we were scheduled to have a um, um, an art festival. That would mandated that they would have had to be there. So it was at uh, they were they were coming up on some time frame where a lot of overtime was going to be required. Uh, so it was kind of surprising that they would just uh, out of the blue uh, decide to gather and go downtown uh, to do this this quite large work patrol. There was probably. Uh, somewhere between eight to ten riders and horses that were in route. Was that order uh, to settle up given before the bombing? Yes, sir. They were they were actually leaving and would have already been downtown by the time the bomb went off, according to one of the supervisors. Had it not been for one of our officers, uh, was slow in getting ready, and uh, they were just pulling out of the K-90 Quiet Center when the bomb detonated. All right, when we come back, I'm going to ask you, what do the rank-and-file Oklahoma City police think 16, 17 years after this tragedy that's been used to butcher the Bill of Rights and Constitution. This is another super uh, disgusting thing we have to discuss, but, I mean, it's only going to get worse if, if, if we don't wake up to false flag terror. Don Browning, retired Oklahoma City police officer, one of the first on the scene, is our guest, along with one of the filmmakers, Holland Vanden Neuenhoff. I'm Alex Jones. You know, I am a father. I have three great children. I love my wife. I love life. And I've been threatened, I've been beat up before uh, when I was exposing the Waco situation and the trial and bullhorning the judge. And they sent five guys, four of them attacked me, beat me up pretty bad, but I beat them up too in a parking lot telling me, shut up.
they broke my nose and punched me. I mean, and that, but you know what? That was when I knew how real this was. Okay. And the federal government is run by a bunch of criminals now who just think that we're here to be doormats and our, our property, our children belong to them. And we can beat these people. But let me tell you, living in denial, this isn't about just criticizing the government and we come up with fanciful tales. This is a police officer who was there and saw all this, who had FBI agents threaten to kill him and his wife. Other cops got killed. Doctors got killed. Grand jurors got threatened. These are FBI comes to your house with guns and says, shut your mouth. The other people come and say, you're dead if you keep this up. This is what they do. I mean, and, and somebody's got to call them on it. Somebody's got to realize it. That, that this country, I mean, they are now announcing they're going to use the military against the American people. We get the Department of Defense contact. Joe Joseph calls us and says, have you seen this? This is on the federal government's own website. And then they pull it where they, they call the American people the enemy, the red group, and the government is the blue group. And, I mean, the general public is listed as the enemy. That's not the American government. You get a police officer's questioning and they go, we think you're in a militia, implying they were involved in it because they're asking questions. You cannot control reality by being delusional. You can't just say, oh, this couldn't be true, like the awesome police chief said two weeks ago when I was talking to him privately. And I looked in his eyes and I could tell he's not stupid. He says he listens to the show. He knows. And he said some things privately to me. I don't want to, I'll get him in more trouble not saying what he said. He didn't say it's off record. He's just like, yeah, I'll probably never get promoted above Austin because I'm even on your show, but I don't care anymore. Alex, I know you're a good guy. I'll see you later. But the point is, that's not enough. You've, I can tell our police chief's a real person. He's, you've got to choose what side you're on. In closing, Don Browning, and people can get the film which people have given their lives for you to be able to know this information, noble lie at infowars.com. Get it out to everybody. In the two or three minutes we've got left with you and Holland, Bandon Neuenhoff, what do the other police officers around you say? Or, I mean, do they just give in to the big lie? Uh, it's interesting. <clears throat> it's kind of a combination of, of both where uh, some are, are literally uh, scared to death. Uh, Terry Yankee's good buddy at one point uh, met me uh, shortly after Terry had died, told me that I was on the right track. Please keep on pushing. Terry deserved that, but he couldn't help me. And uh, uh, officers, for the most part, do, uh, or at least at this point, starting to finally come out with the feelings and, and emotions that they they did not eat the story. They, they didn't battle it, but they did not eat the uh, uh the information was handed out to us. Why didn't you guys just, why didn't you guys get together and, and circle the wagons and say, we got guns too, you want to threaten mm -hmm. us? I, at the time of the circling of the wagons, I don't think we felt like there was enough of us to circle, uh, uh, even half of the circle, so we hit down. Uh, well, there wasn't uh, at the Alamo either, but we appreciate right. your incredible courage, sir. But sometimes right. it takes some of us getting wiped out so other people can see, and then that's when we get the victory. What was interesting, I'll, I'll share a comment that Stephen Jones made when I was up at uh, McVeigh's trial. Uh, Jones uh, came to me. He had been part of the uh, Roger Dale Stafford uh, defense team when Roger Dale Stafford had committed the uh, Sirloin Stockade murders. And I had testified in that case as well. And uh, I shook my head as I was walking up towards him coming back to the hotel. And uh, he, he stopped me and he says, you know, if only four or five Oklahoma City homicide detectives would investigate this. We'd have this solved in two or three days. And uh, I'll tell you what, I, sir, we're out of time, but you've been gracious enough to be on the nightly news tonight. I want to start over where we left off here. Incredible. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sinus Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there, wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there, InfoWars.com.